the darkness has come and the rains are here. We're Back gonna... to the Vancouver mopiness. It's definitely a Vancouver <clears throat> mopiness time. Stare into the abyss at some point and mm -hmm. actually it'll look back at you. The, the abyss was looking back at me and then it got bored and looked away. Harsh. <laughs> Super harsh. <laughs> Welcome to Podkeep Our Land. It's what Jim Egan would have listened to. I'm Erin Rennie. And I'm Patrick Meehan. And I'm Matthew Naylor. And we are a show about Canadian politics, parliaments, politicians, and policy. It's October 5th, 2017, and we are recording from Vancouver, BC. We've got a great show for you tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about four things. I'm going to start with the Vancouver by-election, moving on to electoral reform in British Columbia. We'll have a discussion about PrEP and Pharmacare. And we'll end the evening out with discussion of the new NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. So let's start with the Vancouver by-election. I understand that the um, the candidates debate is taking place right now. We've got uh, a lot of candidates running for one seat and that seat is available because Jeff Meggs, who had been on city council for a long time, is now working for the new BC NDP government. It's been pretty hilarious because uh, we've been following the debate here and uh, Pete Fry managed to gain and lose someone's vote during the course of the <laughs> evening. <laughs> Anything can happen in a Vancouver by by-election. Um, it's actually been a long time since we had a by-election. I didn't realize this. Uh, and they are not expecting voter turnout to be that high. There hasn't been a lot of coverage of this issue, and we've actually heard a lot of our fans and friends reach out to us saying, who should I vote for? I don't know what to do on this election. So so we're here to give you a little bit of information. Um, we can let you know that uh, voting day is October 14th. Advanced polling was yesterday, but also October 10th. So you can get out and vote on those days. And there are a number of candidates for city council. Uh, should I go through them right now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and then maybe we can get into a bit of a discussion. Mm -hmm. So first of all, on uh, more to the right, the NPA is running Hector Bremner, who is a former BC Liberal staffer. Vision Vancouver is running Diego Cardona. He's 21. He came to Canada as a Colombian refugee, and he's a community advocate living here in South Vancouver. The Greens are running Pete Fry, who's a communications professional. He ran once before. A new party, one City is running Judy Graves, who has 40 years experience working for at City Hall and as a, a major um, housing advocate and homelessness advocate in the city for a long time. The other um, big person that we've been hearing a lot from is uh, Jean Swanson, who's running as an independent, but she's uh, been endorsed by COPE. The ghost, uh, the ghost of COPE. <laughs> on the left. <laughs> Uh, so she's been an anti-poverty advocate in the city for a long time and she recently won or was uh, um, given the Order of Canada. And then we have a few smaller name candidates. Uh, Sensible Vancouver is running Mary Jane Watermelon Dunstan, who's a cannabis ad activist. And then Damian Murphy, a nonprofit housing worker. And then two fellows in their 20s who are running to represent uh, young folks in the city, Gary Lee and Joshua Weisenlenkoff. Sorry if I mispronounced announce that. <clears throat> so lots of folks running for one seat. What have you guys noticed so far in this uh, in this race? The marijuana advocate's name sounds like a cannabis strain. Does it? It is probably it? actually is. Mm -hmm. um, she's been tied into that community for a long time. Uh, famously uh, sold watermelon at Wreck Beach for a number of years. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was arrested over it or something. There's photos. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, that is a good point. Sorry, arrested <laughs> for selling watermelon at Wreck Beach? I think it was alcoholic watermelon. Mm. Well, oh, what I a hero. I remember that. Well, what's interesting about her is housing, obviously, is one of the, the big mm -hmm. issues. Uh, as I, think, I think someone said it is the first, second, and third yeah, issue. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So housing is big. It's big for all of us. But um, what Mary Jean Watermelon was also wanted to bring to the table uh, was was highlighting the, the opioid, opioid crisis. And she's one of the few candidates who's made that part of her um, her platform. So that's interesting. Yeah, I think also there's there's a, a real youth movement here. Uh, yeah. You've got, I mean, Diego Cardona is 20. 21 years old, which is quite young, a little on the young side. Uh, but also, Hector Bremner himself is not. Uh, he's, uh, mm -hmm. I think, he's probably a Gen Xer, if not borderline baby boomer or uh, millennial, I should say. Uh, Judy Graves and Gene Swanson have been along for a long, around for a long time, so they're not exactly part of that youth movement. But it is interesting to see that you're seeing major parties starting to run people that aren't baby boomers in a, in, a, in major races. Yeah, absolutely. What do, why do you think that is? They're running younger candidates uh, in this particular race. I think, I think the time marches onwards. Yeah, but... I think there was a UK paper that referred to 
the generational time bomb sitting under Elizabeth or Elizabeth May? No, Theresa May, the other May, mm. uh, sitting under UK Prime Minister Theresa May, because her her entire voter base is old people uh, and Brexit voters who are likely old, likewise old people. Uh, and so that that generation shift has finally, I think, occurred. Mm-hmm. And it's cool to see it happen. Yeah. So the the parties are starting to see that if they want to re- remain viable in in coming elections, they need to build loyalty today amongst mm-hmm. young people, especially yeah. since millennials are the the biggest generation the world has ever seen. Mm-hmm. You probably want to be friendly mm-hmm. to them. And, and millennials probably. have gotten to the point where they are um, like starting to pay attention to the world around them. And um, you Vote, know, like, vo- voting trends were up significantly <clears throat> in the last federal election, as an example, amongst millennial voters. Yeah, um, they, I think millennials were millennials the largest block in the last election. I, like, no, was... uh, but they will be the largest block in the next federal election, okay. and, and every provincial election from now on. I think. Yeah, so like that that trend like is irreversible, and it means that um, like the, the parties who are able to capitalize on that vote are are set because like a lot of people will pick a party and vote for it forever. Uh, it is interesting though to see the NPA candidate be not your not your father's NPA as you would say. True. Um, the NPA candidate Hector Bremner has been talking about rezoning uh, all of the single family zoned hot lands in Vancouver, which is a statement that I wonder if the NPA will carry forward to the next election. Uh, it is definitely an NPA that has more of a human face to it and is actually coming to the table with like reasonable housing uh, initiatives rather than the NPA that sort of stuck its head in the sand for the last 10 years. So we, we said already that housing was the biggest issue. Do you think the housing is the biggest issue, uh, like that that housing issue and the millennial voter are connected somehow, that, that that's why they're running these younger we, folks? We are the ones that don't have homes. I yeah. mean, in terms of ones that we own. Uh, home ownership amongst millennials is significantly lower than it was at baby boomers at the same age and Gen X at the same age. Significantly lower. Uh, and rent costs uh, adjusted for inflation are significantly higher now than they were uh, for baby boomers or Gen X. And so, yeah, I think we're, we're hopping mad that we're now in our 30s and not able to buy a place or even afford a reasonable size rental. Right, right. And and that's not stopping millennials from having <clears throat> children. They're starting families and mm-hmm. they don't have enough space to to raise them. And that's, uh, that's I have a, a significant problem. There's a social scientist who has this book that I just love. If, uh, if a human is given enough calories, he will eventually stagger to the age of maturity and reproduce. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. So, so of what you've heard from all of these candidates, what what, um, what strikes you as like the most reasonable solution or the most likely? Uh, we, we're hearing everything from rezone all of the city all the way to Gene Swanson, who's proposing a mansion tax. Uh, to, to be honest, the rezoning, and I don't want to get too, too into the weeds on zoning issues, um, but the rezoning concept of taking single family home zoned areas that can only be single family homes and allowing them to be, say, three story apartment buildings, that would build a lot of housing very fast and a lot of the the, the the problems we have with arguments and screaming and yelling matches at city halls over the height of buildings would be ignored at that point because they were talking about three or four story buildings the um and, and actually three or three or four story buildings uh in everywhere is like a very effective way of creating quite a bit of density yeah. it's what most of paris is it's, like paris like, doesn't have a lot yeah. above uh five stories you look at a like picture of downtown paris and it's, it's something something like a just the eiffel tower <laughs> something like a thousand horse-sized ducks and a and one duck-sized horse mm-hmm Mm-hmm. Or yes. Did I get that wrong? Yeah. It's a Reddit thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, but so yeah. Like a thousand? I would be terrified of a thousand horse-sized ducks. Okay, yeah, I got that one backwards. It's a thousand duck-sized horses, or one horse-sized duck. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what is is the horse the multifamily building in this scenario? It's, I think it's the, volume. I think okay, versus, yeah, the, okay. versus the very large <laughs> object. Yeah, uh, but yeah. So that you're the one who killed the metaphor this week. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, so, but, but yeah, I think that that's a, that's a good one. Uh, Gene Swanson and uh, and uh, Graves, Judy Gra- Gene Swanson and Judy Graves have both come out with really sensible policies for low income housing developments. That I think uh, there's no one solution to the housing problem. The housing problem we, we probably have need all of the solutions. Yeah, and so you know we need solutions for low income people. We need solutions for middle income people. We need solutions just to have more housing in general. The mansion tax is stupid though. Like property taxes should be equitable and not like. <laughs> I haven't looked into it enough to be honest. Um, I was annoyed that they also like went to Chip Wilson's house. Um, His house is particularly ugly. I cycle by it on a regular basis. Is basing property tax based just only on the value of the property equitable though? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay, carry on. Now that's the end of my point. All right. Let's uh, let's shift gears here a little bit and talk about politics of this um, the Vancouver by-election. So Vision Vancouver, generally center-left, mostly federal liberals and federal NDP. They have six seats on council if you include the mayor. 
there. So their majority isn't threatened here. Mm -hmm. The NPA, it doesn't make a huge difference for them whether they get a person on or not in terms of passing motions. But for the Greens, if they get a second person on, they can get their motion seconded, which means they can bring things up for debate. So it makes a big difference for um, for Adrian Carr and the, and the Greens. It also, I, I, I dispute that analysis because I actually think uh, that this would be somewhat of a check on vision if Hector Brenner is elected because it denies sure. uh, vision the two-thirds majority that they have. Mm -hmm. But but I think it also gives a, a weapon to vision for the general election next year if the NPA gets in is to say, hey, everybody vote for us because when we split the vote, the NPA gets in. And so this is, I think that's part of why the, the Vision Vancouver is, and I, I don't want to say that that, Diego, uh, that Cardona is not a, a good candidate. He's got a really good, he's got a really good uh, record uh, for being a 21-year-old. It's arguably a better record than I would have if I ran for politics right now. Um, but they're definitely not running a heavy hitter because I think they're seeding this election so that they can use that argument in the next election is, hey, the NPA got in last time because you split the vote 17 ways. Everybody come together on, with, on the vision team. I mean, that, that is some... I think that's playing some like three-dimensional checkers. Uh, I, I think that's a dumb thing for, for vision to be doing because, one, seeding control of council, seeding power is never something so, that you should so then, be doing. But then why aren't they running somebody that's... No, because they've made hitter. a strategic error. I think that they've decided to run somebody young to try to like show that the party cares about youth. Oh yeah, that's because Vision's caucus is incredibly old. Yeah, yeah, but they're seen as being out of touch wealthy white people. They are out of touch wealthy white people. So who did they run? A very young immigrant. Like this is a really good candidate for them to improve a lot of their their, their image. And I think they've decided to not necessarily win this by election. So they sent a young person of color on a race they knew they would lose. That's really good diversity there. I will say that I think that uh, Jean Swanson has the best slogan and the best posters in the race. Uh, her slogan is Jean against the machine and I think that that's, <laughs> that's amazing. amazing. <laughs> uh, and there's an outline of a Swan on her posters because her name is Swanson. So she's not only had one dad joke in her posters, she's managed to stuff in two. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. It's not as good as uh, former Alberta NDP leader's uh, slogan from the, I think, 2001 election, which was, his his, um, his name was uh, Raj Panu, and it was Raj against the machine. Yeah, that's a good one. That's yeah. great. Yes. That's great. So, uh, like you said, the voter turnout's going to be low. They're anticipating it yeah. to be, uh, you know, less than 20% or something. So every vote is really going to make a difference mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it will help the Greens a lot. I think the Green voter is a voter that wants to come out and support the Greens. They're, they're dyed in with it, whereas the Vision vote, I think, is going to really not come out. I don't think Vision supporters are very excited about municipal politics right now. Mm. Which Any... is... Sorry, go ahead. Um, like, which is great for the MPA, because I think the MPA, uh, if it elects Hector, um, has two like young and dynamic city councillors who... Who's the second one? Melissa to Genova. Oh, right, she exists. I'm, yeah. I always think about uh, Elizabeth Ball and Jordan, Jordan Affleck. Yes, those are the other two. Okay. Uh, but yes, Melissa Dinova, the largest single vote getter for the NPA. Uh, and Hector Bremner would be, uh, I think, a, an interesting pair on council because it would signify a substantial transition in uh, the MPA elected leadership. Yeah. Uh, and I do think that Hector Bremner wins. I think that this is a race that the NPA is set to win. They've got a block of votes that are theirs, and the there are uh, so many candidates on the left of center that I think that there's no chance of the left winning it. Uh, I think that you're gonna, you're looking at you know vision. Vision, Gene Swanson, uh, Judy Graves, uh, Pete Fry, although the Greens aren't necessarily on the left, they bestride the weird. Uh, and then you also add in um, uh, Dunder, Dunder, uh, Dunstan? Dunstan. You also add in Dunstan. That's five candidates of the left uh, right there versus the one candidate of the right. Now, I mean, obviously right and left are a bit weird when it comes to municipal politics, but that really splits that vote. Matthew, do you want to make a prediction? Uh, I, I think Hector wins. I think voter turnout is 19%. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Hector wins with a plurality and not a majority oh, of the votes. I think Hector's going to get something like 32% of the vote. Uh, and then 70% of voters will vote for not Hector Bremner. Uh, mm. I think that that's going to be a really ugly look uh, for the, the, the believability of the system. What an interesting thing to mention about, you know, vote totals and people winning with less than a majority support. Yes, we are going to talk about electoral reform, but first... Oh, first. We are going to talk about the school board election. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, in addition to having your opportunity to vote for another city councillor, you also have the opportunity to vote for nine school trustees in Vancouver because last year, the Minister of Education fired the entire school board for failing to pass a balanced budget. So we now need to replace our school board. So you have the opportunity to, to choose nine trustees. 
I can't tell you anything about the people who are running, but... <laughs> uh, Mike Lombardi is, was a very good school trustee in the last election. Yeah. Uh, Vision school trustee. He's likely to, to stomp to victory for the for, and probably top Vision's list. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I would say, I would support Mike Lombardi generally. It should be noted that Vision is running, uh, I believe, whatever they need for the bare majority and yeah, not five person ca- Yeah, they're, they're running five candidates. Oh, interesting. Um, in fact, the, the NPA, I think, is also only running five candidates. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then uh, one city and Cope are each running two or three each, and then the, the Greens, I think, are running two as well, including Janet Fraser, who may not do well. Why is that? Uh, Janet Fraser was the, 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 the holder of power when it came to the last school board, uh, and so she was the one that got to choose whether or not to, to put Patty Backus back in as chair of school board, mm. when Patty Backus had won, had gotten nearly twice as many votes, I think, as the next highest person, uh, and she chose to instead back the NPA, which was seen as a bit of a, a, a stab in the back to a lot of people that voted for her, and so it'll be very interesting to see where green votes go on her. She's quite the controversial candidate in that way. She is. Uh, she was the green candidate in Vancouver Langara in the last yes. election. Mm, right. uh, and while I didn't vote for her then, uh, I think I will be voting for her now because I think that Patty Backus's leadership of the school board was unnecessarily confrontational. We, we may need to agree to disagree uh, on that one. <laughs> that might take a lot more of a conversation than we're here for. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is an important issue even if you don't have children in the school system, so do get yourself educated and, and get out there and vote for your school board. I care about the education system because I do not like living in a society of stupid people. Right? Stupid people are the worst. I know. Well, and, maybe not the worst. none of them listen to this podcast, so... <laughs> we have the true. most educated listener base anywhere, we think. No, we have the most brilliant listener base. <laughs> We love our listeners. Um, so, yes, get involved in your municipal election. I want to get one plug-in. I want uh, for the interesting municipal election that is going oh, to right. be happening right over the mountains in Calgary. Ah, yes. Where the world's greatest mayor is in the fight for his political life <gasps> against Bill Smith. Not Bill Smith. Yes, Bill Smith, the most generic name imaginable. Um, Nahed Nenshi, uh, the first uh, Muslim mayor elected to lead a Canadian city and generally viewed progressive politician and also mayor who has a bit of a problem getting uh, winning votes on city council is according to a poll by Main Street Technologies a uh, down uh, which is surprising to many uh, but it means that Bill Smith this this relative newcomer to the uh, political scene in terms of elective politics might become the next mayor of Calgary okay. so uh, stay tuned for that Ned Nenshi uh, won the last election with 74% of the vote Mm-hmm. So this would be an incredible fall from grace. Well, and him and Gregor and Gregor Robertson, as well as Don Iverson in Edmonton, have formed a bit of a trio of like a three musketeers fighting for city rights in Canada and per, in, in Canada with the federal government and talking about the ways big cities can operate. And so it would be a real big blow to the, the movement for big cities to gain more ability to, to govern themselves. Potentially. I don't know much about Bill Smith, so I can't speak to what he'd actually stand for. And when's the Calgary election? The Calgary election is October 16th. So any listeners in Calgary, please get out and vote in your um, uh, municipal election. We love municipal politics. But now we're going to move on to BC politics because we also love that so much. Electoral reform. We keep talking about this. It comes back and forth year after year. Um, Every time we have an election and we're unsatisfied with how um, first past the post uh, delivers for us and so Canadians are really interested in the potential for uh, some kind of alternative to the first house system and it was an electoral uh, promise from the Greens and I believe from the NDP as well. It was part of their confidence and supply agreement that they would um, uh, put forward some electoral uh, uh, legislation uh, very soon into their mandate and they have done that. The minister or sorry the Attorney General David Eby put forward um, the electoral reform uh, referendum act says that we are going to have a, re- a referendum it's going to be mail in ballot and it's going to give us the opportunity to potentially do a new way of voting here in BC. What do you guys think? I, I would be interested in looking at the effects from particularly Oregon on whether mail-in ballots make people vote yes or or are more vote motivated oh, to vote okay. like one particular way <laughs> or not. Um, I want electoral reform but I don't necessarily want like any electoral reform. I'll take anything that's not first best. Mm. I'll take anything that is 
better than first past the post and every democratic system is better than first past the post i i can't say that i i was against mmp uh, like i'm sorry i was against stv last time uh, it's it's still better than first past the post i i i had my problems with stv last time as well and i i was a lot younger and i i disagreed with it because i wanted a different system uh but i'm at a point now where first past the post is the most frustrating system i mean we just talked about the municipal elections and how a candidate is likely to win with 32 percent of the vote or 35 percent of the vote at most and that is i think obnoxiously wrong uh we need a different system so are you happy with to see this legislation being taken? Yeah, I'm really curious yeah. to see how it goes. Uh, as a mail-in ballot, it's going to be interesting. Turnout will be low. And that's one of the problems in PEI. PEI had a referendum on electoral reform that passed last year. Um, really? Yeah, but the premier said that he wasn't... I think it was PEI. It was a plebiscite. Um, yeah, but the premier said he wasn't going to implement it because the turnout was lower than he was willing to accept. And uh, also the system that he didn't want one. Yes. Uh, and similarly, in 2005 with STV, with STV, it passed. 59% of British Columbians voted in favor of it uh we've never had an uh we've, other than 2001 we've never had an election where a political party won a majority of seats with 59 percent of the vote uh and 59 percent of people said they supported stv in 2005 i will point out that like the mail-in ballot doesn't necessarily mean that the turnout is going to be low um you know 52 percent which is the turnout for the last hst referendum uh isn't stellar but it's not abysmal either. yeah but i think that they, that was something that people were that was on the tip of everyone's tongue that was being talked about by everybody at the water coolers that was the biggest issue. Uh, that was the biggest political issue of the last 10 years, which is sad to say that a minor alteration to our tax system was the biggest issue of the last 10 years, the but it was. Oh um, oh um, and so we'll see where it goes. I'm really excited to see it. I, I'm curious that, that it seems possible that there's going to be more than two options on the ballot. First past the post will almost for sure be on the ballot, but that uh, more multiple other options may be on the ballot and that they, they've come up with a system to determine, or they haven't come up with a system yet, but they've come up with a process to determine a system for how to actually determine determine which one wins it so they're not so they're not oh god Con condorcet is a uh, political system for those that don't know designed by a french revolutionary in the uh, revolutionary in the french revolution a french a french mathematician uh, like, who was also highly active during the french revolution yes uh, as was everyone with, in france i guess yes it kind of embroiled um, the whole country anyways, so condorcet <laughs> is a weird weird way of electing things uh, <laughs> but it's really curious to me that they're gonna figure because it, in my mind, if there's three uh, three options on a ballot, uh, a single transferable vote makes perfect sense in that situation. Uh, it's where you get into multi more than three that it becomes more difficult. But they have laid out a, a, a roadmap for how they're going to determine that election uh, based on how many things are on the ballot. It, it seems like there's there's a lot of unknowns here. We don't know how the mail-in ballot is going to affect us. We don't know what's going to be on the ballot. We don't know what the threshold is going to be for passing um, whatever it is is decided and so it's it's really hard to come down one way or the other because the, it, it like you said Matthew it really depends on what what's on the table and how we decide and so I'm like for my for me I'm, I'm just kind of worried that this is going to go the way that the, the last two electoral reform proposals went where we did a lot of really really excellent uh, consultation and deep democracy and the work of the um, of the of the citizens assembly to to consider all the different options and how to make it work for British Columbians and then and then to see it go nowhere would be just I feel like a real blow for for improving our democracy in BC so the, the process is critical here how do we make sure it's the process that's going to be fair but also lead to real change uh, it is notable to say that both the Greens and the NDP have pledged as part of their agreement to campaign campaign for a for for an alternative system uh, in whatever vote comes in the vote in, in next fall. And so one of the things that they said caused the, the some of the failures in previous referendums was that political parties stayed out of it. And I think if political parties weigh in and say yes, this is good, we need to change the electoral system. First past the post is a is a wildly unfair system. Uh, then I think you're going to see that uptick in support. I think that's going to be good for uh, for the hopes of changing the system. I feel that it's a, a good opportunity for the province to pass electoral reform because I think the people who are most um, constitutionally um, dis no, what's the word? Uh, the, the people who are most uh, presupposed against the idea is are, are people who are BC liberals who uh, 
uh, might have temporary but you know real grievances with the electoral system after the last election, and so it might be a good political opportunity for for this to yeah. to get passed. Oh, interesting. So they weren't they weren't happy with how the system worked out for them this time. Yeah, because a lot of them felt like, oh, we won the election, we got the most votes, we got the most seats. I, I saw a Facebook post by a former liberal staffer, a friend of mine, to that effect just yesterday, where he said the people of BC should have a government that that they elected and not the government they have. And I mean, I think that's laughably ignoring how democ- how like principles of democracy work. But it is a feeling within liberals that I see. Yeah, I mean, like another good time would have been after the 1996 election, where the BC Liberals like won substantially more votes than the NDP, mm-hmm. and um, just in a very geographically inconvenient way. Yep. Well, and, but the, that did happen. That's what started the STB conversation. Yes, and yep. then the BC Liberals won, and so the BC Liberals are a fickle bunch, uh, and so they Which, decided that they were going to uh, kind of. <laughs> Which is doubly funny because we have had an STV system in the past, and the 1952 election was fought under an STV system. Uh, and I didn't know that. Yeah, in 1952, huh. uh, the Liberals and the Conservatives finally broke up their union government that they had to keep the NDP out, or the CCF as it was called at the time. Uh, they finally didn't like each other enough that they decided to go up against each other, but they wanted to rig the system so that they didn't split the vote and allow the NDP to win. So they created a, the STV system so that Liberal voters would presumably put the Conservative second on their ballot and vice versa. What ended up happening was that everybody, including the NDP, put Socred second, and the Socreds won a stomping majority and were in power for 20 years. Mostly because five minutes after he got elected, Wacky Bennett decided that the, fit, that the STV system was a really easy way for parties to come out of nowhere and win, so he got rid of it. Huh. Interesting lessons to learn from that story. Yeah, well, and I think that that's the key part there, too, is that people often say that we can't change the electoral system without a referendum and all that. Uh, and I actually think that that's bunk. We've had very different electoral systems over the last 50 years. I think referenda are generally pretty illegitimate as decision-making tools. Yeah, I, I, I agree. They're not a very effective... They're an effective way for, for, for people to say they don't like government. Now, a friend of mine, Corey Hogan, who used to host the Strategist podcast, uh, commissioned a poll that uh, polled on three different questions that essentially asked the same thing on electoral reform. And these randomized samples, because of the way the question was phrased, had something like a 20-point spread yeah. in the amount of uh, people who were in favor of ele- electoral reform. And so, like, in a system where we know enough about psychology and, um, like, public opinion to game the system, I'm not sure that referenda are effective anymore. Okay, how about this? What if in your <laughs> referendum package that you get in the mail, you also have the opportunity to answer a question that's like, are you grumpy about government and why? So you get that out of the way and then you get to express how grumpy you are. You have your five minutes of hate. Yeah. And then yeah. and then you get to the other ballot, which is like, how do you feel about this very nuanced policy issue that we would like your opinion on? And then and then they wouldn't feel the need to like <laughs> insert their grumpiness into the policy decision. Well, and, and that's, I guess, fine. But it, that that's not the the problem that I'm concerned with. It's the like people sending a message with their ballot through the HST is is like unfortunate. But it's the idea that like having the word change in the uh, in the word because people have this sort of visceral reaction against change. Uh, will cause the yes vote to drop by like 20 points. Uh, uh, and so like okay. it's just that like psychological yeah. manipulation that right. can happen in the sentence structure. Sure. Okay. So it's it's a uh, risk aversion, change aversion. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. It's it's a very it's a very difficult thing to ask people to weigh in on complex issues. That's why we have representative democracy. Our society isn't built around the idea of people having specific says on specific issues. Also, I'm a busy guy. I do not have time to deal with like the interest of the management of the Ministry of Forests and Range. Don't move to America then. Ballot oh, initiatives all the time. <laughs> it's so... Okay, I was down in America recently, and, th- like, does democracy ever stop nope. there? No. Nope. Like, it's... Night and day. <laughs> like, <clears throat> there are election signs. There are election signs every time I go to America. I want to elect... Like, I don't even necessarily agree with electing the school board. I want to elect a city council, a mayor, a provincial representative, a federal representative, and that's it! <laughs> you, you don't want to vote for, like, pool district or, like, cemetery board? Or, or your local judge and district Oh my attorney. god, don't even get me started on elected <laughs> judges! Well, I've got a controversial case in front of me and I'm up for re-election in the fall. I wonder how I should rule. And then, like, 16 different initiatives to raise your property taxes to pay for all sorts of different things that are really important, but maybe... And don't actually raise your property taxes by very much at all. (laughs) 
Indeed. That's what I have to say to it. So, yes. so we have a referendum in the, uh, the fall of next year on electoral reform. We have yet to know what the, the electoral reform to be presented is, but I'm excited for it uh, because first past the post is the worst. Yes, and it gives us all lots of opportunities to talk about how we do democracy in BC, which makes me happy. Are we ready to move on? Yeah, I, th- I think so. All right. So our next topic is um, about the provincial funding of uh, a prep and pharmacare. Matthew, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and the background of that? Sure. So uh, a lot of the information and the, the genesis from this is coming from an article in The Extra, which is the uh, gay newspaper uh, or online news source now that they don't have a print publication. But uh, PREP is an acronym for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Or, um, and pre-exposure prophylaxis is something that people can take on an ongoing basis to prevent uh, an HIV expo- exposure from developing into uh, actually having HIV. Uh, that uh, has been, over the past couple of years, implemented in various places around uh, America and around the world. Uh, Ontario and Quebec recently just announced programs uh, that cover PrEP for certain people. Uh, and John Horgan, before the election, said that it was a mystery to him why PrEP had not yet been covered. There is a uh, process by which these these drugs are covered, but uh, that process has not apparently yet come to fruition. And uh, there is some debate as to like whether this is a good idea. We actually did a little bit of reportage here, now that we are... Did you just say reportage? Uh-huh. Now that we Does are that involve a canoe over your head? Yeah, um, that's how I do all my research, though. <laughs> <laughs> the library was not happy with me. <laughs> Just knocking over bookshelves every time you turned around. Yeah, but that's just like, I'm huge. That's just what happens. <laughs> the canoe was not... They didn't understand. The canoe was simply for... <laughs> Decorative purposes. Yeah. <laughs> It helps okay. unlock the thinking. Matthew was doing reporting. Yes. Uh, while doing portage. <laughs> a reportage. Yeah, so... What did you n- now that bring we are, back for us? Now that we are a medium, a, i.e. the singular of media... We tell the truth? We tell the for- like people's fortunes? Yeah, I guess so. We were pretty. I guess we that, kind of have been. Yeah. So... We asked the Ministry of Health what the progress of covering PrEP was, uh, especially given uh, Premier Horgan's uh, statements on the topic to this point. They have responded that it's going to take some time as a new government, but they're committed to enhancing evidence-informed decision-making. Uh, now, saliently, there is a couple processes that they mention in their response, and I'll, I'm going to quote specifically uh, the thing on where it is. Uh, in that process. The Common Drug Review's approval of Truvada, i.e. the the PrEP drug, included securing a better price for PrEP. On this note, BC is also participating in the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance negotiations to get the best available pricing in Canada for PrEP. Generic versions of Truvada recently became available in Canada and are priced lower than the brand product. And it's not like a small amount lower. Uh, it is 75% lower. Uh, the Common Drug Review is a thing that various ministries of health across Canada have entered into to uh, align their drug approvals and drug coverage plans. And the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance is the manifestation of that uh, approval process into like this negotiating body that is able to uh, negotiate for lower drug prices, which is one of the major, major savings of the Canadian healthcare system that gets passed on to Canadians. When, when I go to London Drugs and I get a, a, a you know a, some some codeine medication because I've got a, I've got the flu, it's going to cost me like thirty dollars as opposed to eighty or ninety dollars, mm-hmm. and that if you apply that to all of your prescriptions over the course of the year, especially if you're somebody with a, with a compromised immune system, is going to be a substantial savings, and that's actually a huge benefit. So the, the reason that this is important is uh, HIV infections uh, are on the rise among people who are at high risk for HIV, particularly young gay men. The largest single upsurge in infection rates uh, of any demographic is among gay men who were born after 1990. And uh, while there is some small coverage for PrEP currently for BC, for people who are involved in, uh, for contacts of individuals who are involved in HIV outbreaks, uh, this is something that has been proven to be up to 99% effective if used correctly. Uh, while it should still be used in conjunction with a condom, because most people, uh, according to some studies, use condoms incorrectly because 
actually the mechanical yeah. function of, you know, the whole banana demonstration is... It's somehow lost on people in ways that are confusing. Yeah. Though, like, I, I can I can understand, and I think it is probably easier to get people to take a pill every day than to, mm-hmm. like, learn the actual physical oh. act yeah. to, and get it right every time. So, so you're suggesting that this needs to be funded by the, the, the BC ministry? Yes, and also <clears throat> my contention is that it will be a cost savings in the long term Mm -hmm. because BC and and to the BC Liberals credit they instituted full funding for HIV treatment in British Columbia all of that is run outside of the fair pharmacare system and outside of the the medical like the standard medical system through the BC Center of Excellence where all HIV drugs and all HIV treatments are provided free of charge to individuals that lifetime liability cost is about three hundred and ninety thousand dollars. So, are are you suggesting the BC government should start funding this now at the the current price of something? It's like a thousand dollars a month or something for a person, instead of waiting till that price negotiation is completed so that they can fund it at a, a lower rate per person. I I think that are you would... saying like speed it up and pay the extra money. I, I'm saying both do both of those things. Like yeah, start well, I mean, start. You're gonna have to. You're, you're also gonna have to stop paying for something else, or add more money to the healthcare system. Well, there because, was a quite substantial you know, surplus that the well, government that's, inherited. That's, that's, so. But that's the that's the real thing, and the, the reason why a lot of these things don't get brought in right away is a because they're waiting for trials to be completed. Although in this case, it sounds like it's been done. But b because uh, our, our 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 pharmacare program is relatively limited in how much money it has, and so you know there's a bunch of things that we don't fund. There's uh, various Parkinson's drugs that we could fund that would significantly lower the cost to the healthcare system of people with Parkinson's because they wouldn't be getting you know harmed through other things. They wouldn't be having to go through the hospital so often. But we don't fund that. We could be a hepatitis C is, is having a massive outbreak in British Columbia right now, and we could be funding a, a rapid response to that through pharmacare, and we're not funding that. Uh, we could be doing all these things and we're not funding them because we have a very limited pharmacare system in British Columbia. And so the question is is really I think just increasing funding for pharmaceuticals because that's a part of our healthcare system. Just make it part of MSP. Well, I'd like to get rid of MSP. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, our healthcare system is, is broader than that, and yeah. you know, incorporating all all prescription drugs in MS in, into our healthcare system, I think, is just a, a simple, simple and easy way to to increase affordability. Right, right, yeah. Like the, what what this story highlighted for me is that like we we have a, a basic coverage in in BC for for what you're allowed to receive for free just for being a Brit- a tax paying British Columbian or or a, just a, a resident of British Columbia, but that doesn't include pharmaceutical. No. You and, no. you either receive uh, mar- pharmaceutical insurance through your employer, or if you make under thirty thousand dollars, you get a subsidy from the the BC government. Or if you fall in between there, you pay for all your own drug costs on your own, and that that goes for all different kinds of life saving, life improving, contagion stopping drugs. And and that's that's not just a problem for. For um, for folks who would like to be using prep, it's a, fo- a problem for all British Columbians. Right up until the moment that you end up in the hospital with a life threatening illness, and then all then your then the treatment- taps are open. Yeah, and then your treatment is covered, which is a very stupid way of, of yeah. doing things because it costs more money because hospital time <laughs> is very expensive. Right, well, and, and yeah. people with compromised immune systems are going to have significantly increased costs per month on the basis of mm-hmm. pharmaceuticals, and that's not ha- that's not good. Like that's a, that's a huge uh, reduction in their, in their quality life because they're just having to pay for these things all the time. But speaking speaking to that gap that you were uh, illustrating there, Aaron, what there are other pharmacare programs across Canada, the Régie de l'Assurance Maladie du Québec and the Ontario Trillium Program, which are of, to varying degrees of effectiveness, a public option for people who are uh, either low income or not covered by an employee plan for whatever reason that they can either buy into or are eligible for and can apply for that covers prescription drugs for people who are um, not necessarily super low income uh, but are are not making enough and, and don't have access to affordable prescription drug insurance. Yeah, and they're both they're both funding prep at this point, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and my understanding is the Ontario one is slightly more uh, specific than the BC program, the Pharmacare program in BC, which is relatively similar to Tri- Trillium, but not as not as well covered. Um, but at the end of the day, though, is that e- neither of those programs fully cover pharmaceuticals either, even for low in- even for relatively low income people, like people that we would think to be low income, like forty or fifty thousand dollar a year income levels. 
Yeah, and, and so this this is a, a broader conversation that is informed uh, by this. Like, we don't fund pharmaceuticals in a sensible way in yeah. Canada because, like, medicine <clears throat> is more than leeches and scalpels now. Uh, we have drugs that... <laughs> I mean, we still use leeches and scalpels. Don't don't get me wrong. Like, scalpels, like, last I saw scalpels, last time I watched ER, scalpels, scalpels were a thing. Yeah, and we still use leeches. They're incredibly essential for burn victim treatment, to reattach, the, to get the blood, because they have anticoagulant properties. Well, this is a first for Podcube Our Land. I hope that never happens to me. I also hope it never happens to All you. All right. Okay. Um, anyway, so more this, than leeches. More than leeches, ulcers. Ulcers used to have to be fixed with a surgery that would take up a lot ah, of time and that sounds not pleasant like it was horrible and now we take a pill and the ulcers are gone that has not like that, no, that and reduced the, the, the burden surgery, on medicare the surgery would have been paid for but the pill would isn't paid for now yeah so which so, is maddening because yeah. the pill for everyone who has an ulcer is probably less than like 10 of those surgeries yeah interesting i hadn't thought about it that way so, like, medicine got better, and our politics did not. So, there, there, I think we're all in agreement. Yes, definitely room for improvement. So, prep, though. Like, I, I, do, want, I do want to just have one, <laughs> one final thing, because there is a... I think it is reasonable for people uh, in the gay community to be skeptical of statements like, we are engaging in this process and wanting yeah. to make sure that everything is involved in evidence-based review, because this is exactly the type of language that was used during the original HIV outbreak in the 80s and early 90s. There is uh, a ton of social and cultural uh, factors that go into what drugs get researched and what evidence gets created and generated. And it required people standing up and saying, thousands of people are dying and we need to get drugs into mm -hmm. bodies. And I think that is the same thing that has to happen now. Yeah, now I'm absolutely. Done. Okay. Um, moving on to our next topic. Last weekend, the NDP elected a new leader. Jagmeet Singh was uh, elected on the first ballot. Do you want to tell us all about it, Patrick? Yeah, so uh, in what what is, ended up being quite a surprise, Jagmeet Singh came out with a, a substantial amount of support. He got, I think, 55% on the first ballot uh, and is now the first person of color to lead a major federal political party, which is, I think, something that should not go unsaid all the time. I think it's, it's staggering that in 2017, this is only the first time that that's happened uh, when we are a very multicultural country. And I think it's uh, going to be very interesting Interesting, uh, and we have also discovered very clearly that people aren't capable of determining who Jagmeet Singh is in, in, in a crowd. Uh, as Vice has this wonderful article about all the people who are not Jagmeet Singh, which I highly recommend everybody uh, go look at. Uh, you had a number of incidences in the last week of journalists uh, identifying people who are not Jagmeet Singh, but are just simply happen to be South Asian men uh, as being Jagmeet Singh, which I think is amazing. Yes. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think it's a really interesting shift for the NDP uh, and for Canada to really have somebody at the world stage or at the Canadian national stage that is that a person of color. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this this race has definitely revealed, I think, uh, some of uh, some of the the Canadian racism that we don't like to talk about. And um, and I think that's probably a good thing. It's probably good for, for us mm -hmm. to kind of bring these issues out into the open and, and pull them apart and dissect them and, and try to get to, to what is this really about? What is the fear here? And can we kind of dispel some of that fear? And, and from what I've seen from, uh, from Mr. Singh, he's really, really good at that. I don't know yeah. if you saw that clip of the, the woman at his event yelling and screaming at him and, and accusing him of all sorts of things that... Um, didn't that make sense. Didn't make any sense. And and he was just a very, very graceful response out of yep. him. Um, uh, sort of, I think, role modeling what it, what it means to to um, to sort of bridge that racial divide in Canada. And I think that's that's really some important leadership that we're going to need um, in the years to come. Mm -hmm. So Jagmeet Singh is also a really young person. He the is exact same age as Andrew Shear, although you would never know it. Because Andrew Shear, Andrew Shear, I feel like is perpetually fifty-five and probably has been since he was twelve. <laughs> okay, so so how old are, are Shear and Singh? Does anybody know? They're in their forties. Thirty-nine, I was. Late thirties, right? Um, so that makes Justin Prime Trudeau Minister, the old man of the Canadian old politics. Man. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is. Uh, it means like as we were talking about earlier, uh, some. 
transition of leadership uh, is happening mm-hmm. between generations. We have well, Gen Xers in power uh, and leading all three major federal yeah. parties. At None this of point. the major federal parties are being run by baby boomers for the first time ever, except for the green. I mean, except for the ever. Greens, I guess. But they weren't running. Okay, the- for the first time, for the first time in my life. Uh, and for the first time since uh, Bob Stanfield stopped being the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, uh, the baby boomers have been in power. And now we have Gen Xers. Or, I mean, 1979 is that barrier land between Gen X and Millennials. You could almost say that Andrew Scheer and, uh, mm, that's and, 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 and no, Singh... No, I don't agree with well, that. Well, they're, they're also not Gen Xers in 79. Mm, yes, no. very, they're, they're in a bubble zone. 70, 79 to 82 is considered the Oregon Trail oh, generation. I'm going to do an amazing long-form article that I've read once. Zennials. I think that's another phrase for them. But yeah, it's, it's very interesting that they're even on the, the, the end of the, the Gen X uh, line. And it's really neat to see youth finally taking over. Do you think we're going to see a change youth, in tone? Youth. All those 39-year-old <laughs> youths. <laughs> hey, the youngest Prime Minister in Canadian history was 38, and that was Joe Clark. Mm-hmm. It's <laughs> like all Blanking these Gen Xers there. are going to be sitting around the house watching the real world and <laughs> Beavis and Butthead and <laughs> wearing plaid. Um, is there is there going to be a change of tone? Do you think in in Parliament now that we have all these a different generation of leaders? Parliament is actively dis- like Parliament is designed to actively discourage a change of tone. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Well, those uh, although I think, I think you're, you're right though that Jagmeet Singh and, and Justin Trudeau, uh, if if anything, the NDP decided to fight fire with fire and went with somebody with a similar temperament to Justin Trudeau, somebody that has lived a, a, a rougher life than Justin Trudeau and has lived a, a more real life than Justin Trudeau. And so it's interesting that both of them have that that positive upbeat i mean jagmeet singh takes a fold-up bike with him everywhere he goes like these this is a this is just a fun person who has interesting quirks uh and so i think that, that you're right is that there's that tone shift whereas andrew Shear is sort of andrew Shear i picture in a in a minivan somehow with children in the back uh, well, he has five of them children does he have five is, children i think so doesn't he he has a large that, and young family i can believe that andrew Shear like does represent a tone shift for the Conservative Party, though. Like, yes. I, I think that Andrew Scheer represents a shift away from, like, Harperite mm-hmm. kind of managerial politics to a kind of younger, angrier conservatism. Yeah, and also, like, a, a more free speech-oriented, that sort of Generation X uh, free speech and let, let the ugly statements get made by people kind of attitude. Yeah, unless he's not, you know, because he has made statements on both sides of that. Yes, um, but usually after getting dragged to it um, yeah. by particularly reprehensible Canadian senators. I'm just saying that he is weaselly. <laughs> All right, I can I can get behind that. Uh, but yeah, Jagmeet Singh I think is very interesting. He's also an urban. Uh, he's very urban in how he takes a look at things. He wants a, a national cycling strategy. He wants a national tr- public transportation strategy. Uh, he really cares about cities in a way that I think the NDP, which comes from a rural uh, farmer community roots, has been sort of easing its way towards. Is now decided to go whole haul into the suburbs and this in the, the urban areas of our of our country. So most of his base is in the Greater Toronto area. Uh, and, and the Greater Vancouver area. Right. Um, right. He, he, he gained substantial votes and money from uh, Greater Greater Vancouver. Right. Do, do you think that's going to be a problem in the next general election? Well, that was the interesting question. Is that there was a there was a bit of a a bit of a, ba- a poorly worded attack by Nikki Ashton in one of the debates, uh, saying that uh, he's raising a lot of money and he's setting up a lot of members, but they're all in the same places and that doesn't elect people. And he said, well, yeah, I'm raising a lot of money and that hires people to get orga- to organize in other parts of the country and to build to build a, a national wave and you can't build a national wave without money and support uh, and so I think that'll be interesting to see how that translates uh, he also I think has a ready-made huge bas- bastion of support in urban areas that is going to be mm-hmm. something NDP have never been able to really tap into all that well except for a very short window of time with Jack Layton Right. The comparison to Jack Layton is something that I, I want to focus on for a second because this surprise, and, and both mm-hmm. of us were wrong, Pat, uh, this surprise election win on the first ballot is very similar to Jack Layton's election mm-hmm. in, correct me if I'm wrong, 2003? That sounds about right. It's that era. Uh, and and I, I remember in that uh, going to going to NDP conventions in the early 2000s when I was much more involved in the party. Uh, and I remember people that were relatively senior in the party talking to me about how they wanted it to go to two ballots because they respected Bill Blakey at the time, but they knew that Jack was going to win and that everyone was surprised that Jack got the first ballot. Same thing here. Everyone respected Nathan Cullen. Everybody liked learned to like Guy Curran. Uh, and neither of them did anywhere uh, near as well as they they sort of thought they would, or that the people that people thought they would. The first ballot thing. 
building is good news for them, right? It it means that. Well, it means they're not announcing who won on th- on on Thanksgiving Sunday, right, uh, right? Which was I don't know why they planned that as the second ballot results night. Um, it's probably. I wonder if there's just some people involved in leadership, like election scheduling, who are just you know the dumbest politicians in Canada. <laughs> oh, right. we'll put it on Super Bowl, Super Sunday. Bowl Sunday. Very good. Yes, the, very good. <laughs> the BC the BC Liberals this year uh, that, that had initially decided to go on Super Bowl Sunday that was stunning. <laughs> um, anyway, um, there like I, I was actually a little surprised because I watched the um, the leadership announcement. And I was surprised at how low the production values were for that convention and that announcement. It's like, grassroots organizing, Matthew. It's grassroots. Yeah, I think it's a question. <laughs> like, I, I have seen, you know... I, Nothing was hand-painted, okay? We're doing better than we used to. I, I've, I've crashed NDP conventions before. <laughs> and, like, Jack Layton knew how to run a slick yeah. party operation. And, and those things had some production value and they had some pizzazz. And I don't know whether it's that the NDP didn't expect Jagmeet to win on the first ballot mm. or uh, whether, like, they just kind of dropped the ball. But it was in this tiny room that was, like, could hold, like, 200 yeah. people. And uh, it, everyone was kind of crowded up on the stage and there were, wasn't, like, a, a nice, you know, yeah. visual for, for any of it. Uh, like, a lot of the feed was this thing that had the cameras in the picture, which was mm-hmm. super weird. Uh, well, and I kind well, of wonder about, if it's this missed opportunity well, think, for the NDP. Think about who's running the convention. People who aren't running a leadership campaign. And in a leadership campaign, everyone is on deck with a with one of the leadership campaign teams. All of the senior leadership of the party are on deck with one of the major campaign teams. And then the, 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 the leftover people, or the people that choose to not take a side, or don't get offered to take a side... Are the ones that are left to run the, the convention, and so I don't think that that's necessarily out of line. I remember the the federal liberal co- leadership convention from watching on TV. I know you were there for it, but watching on TV, it was a it was a bit of a disorganized affair. Not a, not anywhere near as as much as you're right that this one was. But which uh, which, which one? Uh, I'm talking about the the Dion the Dion leadership. Oh race. yeah, but that there were it was like disorganized, but it was there were eight candidates and. Like, no one can fault the (laughs) actual, like, presentation on TV, because I think that, like, there were a lot of opportunities that the Liberal candidates were given to preserve their vision. that's true. And there was, like, a very slick production schedule, and there was this big stage, and it looked Mm. like a... Whereas this was just opening an envelope. Like, yeah, it was was opening an envelope and a visible riser. It it didn't have the backdrop and the lighting. It Mm. looked like it was announced in the, you know, Best Western Conference Center. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that speaks to a change in leadership. I think Jack Layton came in with a team in the uh, early 2000s, and that team stuck with him all the way through. And now a lot of that team is retiring, or they've moved on to Alberta. Or I'm sorry, I, I'd like, like to note that the uh, that you banished Tom Mulcair from from the NDP's history. Jack Layton, he was Jack Singh. He was an interim leader in an interim period. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Tom Mulcair, and I think he's done a really good job. <laughs> oh, um, that's that's like the quintessential damning with faint praise. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. So Jagmeet Singh is now the leader, and that's gonna be really interesting to see where Jack Layton goes. Um, Paul the- Wells said that uh, Paul Wells had this really interesting thing where a couple of years ago he was talking to uh, Justin Trudeau, and uh, the, the the conservatives were, or, or was yeah it was. Uh, uh, you win the, the NDP leadership race, I think it was, but he was talking to Justin Trudeau and he said, well, who do you think is going to win? And this was the last NDP leadership race. And Justin Trudeau says, uh, well, I'm hoping for Tom Mulcair because I want an older candidate because I need my candidates opposed to me to be old. So that, 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 dis, that, that disconnect, hmm. which also to my mind shows that Justin Trudeau is a lot better of a strategist than people give him credit for. Uh, but now he's got two people that are significantly younger than him on stage, one of whom very much appeals to the sort of suburban mom and dad, uh, and the other one very much appeals to sort of the the, the, the urban and, and suburban people. And Justin Trudeau doesn't really appeal to the rural voter very well. So where is his base and how is he going to have to respond is going to be very interesting. Yeah, although like the idea of Justin Trudeau now being by default the elder statesman of, <laughs> uh, of this... The old man on the mountain with that beautiful hair. <laughs> No shirt. <laughs> <laughs> he is still probably the best the best looking shirtless leader of a major party. I, I don't know. Do we have pictures of Jagmeet Singh's shirtless? That's a and good Andrew question. He, Jagmeet Singh does cycle a lot. That does build up your core muscles. Ho- hopefully this will engender, you know, the strategist Trudeau 
to be a little more strategic in in being attentive to the issues that a Jagmeet Singh potential voter might uh, use to gravitate towards him. Mm -hmm. There was there was also the, the the anecdote that the conservatives, if they could have, they would have funneled money towards Jagmeet Singh's campaign because the conservatives view their path to uh, to to forming government is through a strong New, De New Democratic Split Party. Oh taking, yeah, hundred percent. Like this, Jagmeet Singh is the the candidate who has created the greatest potential for a conservative victory. That's interesting. I mean, that's 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 the most federal liberal way you could possibly say that. Okay. <laughs> but I like what you were saying earlier about uh, like uh, three strong, vigorous, you know, reinvigorated parties are going to make for more competition in the House, and that hopefully mm. leads to better policy for all Canadians. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think so. What an optimistic note. Yeah. So, we can't talk about politics all night. Uh, we have to think about other things sometimes. Have you guys thought about anything besides politics in the last week? It's salmon viewing season in Metro Vancouver, apparently. Yes, which I've, which I've taken part in several times, every year, basically. You go and you watch the wonderful red-colored salmon return to die. I really recommend, and also breed. I really recommend Bear order. Creek Park in Surrey. It's a great place to go for that. Mm -hmm. Go watch the salmon. Mm -hmm. Swim upstream. Uh, watch the magnificent infrastructure that we have built for the salmon to compensate for the magnificent infrastructure which we have built that uh, provides us with water and power dams and blah, blah, blah. But um, salmon, they create forests by dying from bear attacks. Okay, yeah, salmon. So when I was seven years old, I had an argument with my friends over who the next Wayne Gretzky was, and I was convinced it was Yermer Yager. Uh, and Yermer Yager has, from then on, been my favorite hockey player of all time. Uh, and he signed with one of my most hated teams this week, but that means that he's back in the NHL, and that means that I perpetually can still consider myself younger because a very old man is still playing hockey. Uh, he is now 45 years old, and he's fantastic. And he's now back in the NHL playing for the Calgary Flames. <laughs> but he's back in the NHL, and that makes me very happy. Very Aaron. nice. Very nice. Uh, you know, I had something, and I, it's completely slipped my mind. So I'll just say... Um, Thanksgiving is on my mind. I'm hoping to actually learn to, to, to cook some stuff this year, and um, and I'm wishing everybody a happy Thanksgiving. So uh, that's the, our show for you tonight. Um, I'm Erin Rennie. I'm Matthew Naylor. And I'm Patrick Meehan. We are a show about Canadian politics, parliaments, policy, and politicians. You, we make new shows every two weeks. Um, if you liked what you heard, please share this episode with all of your friends. If you want to make sure you never miss an episode of Pod Keep Our Land, please make sure to uh, subscribe, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. You don't want to get this episode late because they turn stale real fast. Uh, thanks very much <laughs> for listening. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, oh, no, go back and listen to our fantasy cabinet episode. It's so current. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks for listening to Pod Keep Our Land. We'll um, talk to you next time. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>